Hello, this is Pastor Larson, Trinity Lutheran Church in Delray Beach, Florida, welcoming you to another Bible study. And our subject has been and will continue to be for a while, the Lord loves to hear us pray. So we're talking about prayer, but we're also doing a lot of praying, and there's a lot of praying to be done. I know that there are things on your prayer list, and I have my list, which, which grows uh, every week. The Lord loves to hear us pray. Last time we were together, we found encouragements to pray, encouragements to pray along with a bright and clear picture of Jesus himself praying at various times and for various reasons. And today we aim to search the scriptures for examples, examples of those who received answers to their prayers so that the Lord might increase our faith in his many promises to answer our prayers. So let's get started with that. You know, an example is better than a lecture. A picture is worth a thousand words, and I'm saying that an example is worth even more than that. I'll bet you didn't know how many times in the Bible the, you find people praying. I'm going to say it's on the order of hundreds of times that people call upon the Lord in prayer. Some of them very long, some of them exceedingly short. But I've got about a dozen of them, some examples, those particular times that God recorded real living examples of his answers to prayer in the Bible. The first we referred to last week, but we got on a very useful application, not just a tangent, about how God answers the prayers of those who are sick, who want to get better and serve him longer in their lives. So let's get started by reading from 2 Kings chapter 20. Judy, I know that you are often an eager beaver when it comes to reading, so I'll call on you without hesitation. Okay, okay. Thank you. Uh, Hezekiah, found in 2 Kings chapter 20, verses 1 to 6. In those days, Hezekiah became sick and was at the point of death. And Isaiah, the prophet, the son of Amos, came to him and said to him, Thus says the Lord, Set your house in order, for you shall die you shall not recover. Then Hezekiah turned his face to the wall and prayed to the Lord, saying, Now, O Lord, please remember how I have walked before you in faithfulness and with a whole heart and have done what is good in your sight. And Hezekiah wept bitterly. And before Isaiah had gone out of the middle court, the word of the Lord came to him, Turn back and say to Hezekiah, the leader of my people, Thus says the Lord, the God of David, your father, I have heard your prayer. I have seen your tears. Behold, I will heal you. On the third day you shall go up to the house of the Lord, and I will add 15 years to your life. I will deliver you and this city out of the hand of the king of Assyria and I will defend this city for my own sake and for my servant David's sake." That's quite a prayer. Yeah. This, this prayer, based on uh, not just his righteousness, but uh, uh, upon the holiness of God. But he wants to, to base his prayer on what he yet wants to do for the country over which God has set him to rule. So Hezekiah is weeping and praying. And this is amazing in verse 4. Before Isaiah, the prophet, had even gone out of the middle court of the king's palace, the word of the Lord told him to go back and tell him, <laughs> I've got an answer to your prayer. I don't think most of us get answers that quickly to our prayers. Does anybody want to volunteer a, ever happen to you that you, you've got an answer that quickly? Can't recall. Not that I can think of. 
I, I can't think of one either. Mm -hmm. uh, but there are three answers to the prayer. The first is 15 years will be added to your life. Mm -hmm. I don't remember uh, Hezekiah specifying how long he wanted to live. But you yeah, get 15. Yeah. 15 years, that's a long time. Yeah, yeah. It, we don't know how long. long we don't know how old he was when he said that prayer, do we? I have not looked that up. Somebody with a Bible dictionary might be able to find the answer to that. In any case, it's probably going to be what you do is look for his death in the yeah. scriptures, and often the Bible tells us how many years. Mm -hmm. Thank you. It's a good question, but I don't know the answer this morning. Well, the second is, I will deliver you and the city out of the hand of the king of Assyria. Assyria was going to attack. So he's going to defend that city, not only for the sake of the Lord's name, but also for David's sake. Well, David is gone. It's the rule that God had established that David's throne would continue forever. You remember that. And then Jesus, of course, is the one who kindly finally comes to sit on not the literal throne, but to rule over the church. So now I want to go on to another uh, answered prayer. And this one we studied several months ago when we studied Hannah and Samuel and Eli. And you'll remember this. Uh, who's up for reading 1 Samuel uh, chapter 1, selected verses? I will. Hannah, 1 Samuel, 1, 10 to 11 and 7 to 20. She was deeply distressed and prayed to the Lord and wept bitterly. And she vowed a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your servant and remember me and not forget your servant, but will give to your servant a son, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life, and no razor shall touch his head. Then Eli answered, Go in peace, and the God of Israel grant your petition that you have made to him. And she said, let your servant find favor in your eyes. Then the woman went away and ate, and her face was no longer sad. They rose early in the morning and worshiped before the Lord. Then they went back to their house at Ramah and Elkanah. Elkanah knew Hannah, his wife, and the Lord remembered her. And in due time, Hannah conceived and bore a son, and she called his name Samuel. For she said, I have asked for him from the Lord. There's the barren woman yeah. who was granted the gift of a child. And what did she do with the child? She dedicated him to the Lord even before he was born. She promised that she would give him, mm -hmm. and when he was weaned at about the age of three, we are guessing, because it doesn't say, uh, she brought him to Eli and put him into Eli's care, and Samuel uh, grows up and becomes a judge and a prophet. All right. So that's an amazing answer to prayer. One that uh, is shared by, uh, what did we say, uh, percentage of the women in America? A, a rather large percentage. I forgot the number now. But it is a special prayer because God has plans for Samuel. Answered prayer. That's what we're doing this first part of the Bible study this morning. Any comments or questions about this one special prayer? Well, let's go on. And this one, I believe that Pastor Vince had a sermon on several months ago. I remember him chuckling over the fact that the maid comes to the door 
recognizes Peter, but we're getting ahead of the story. <laughs> uh, Linda, would you like to read Acts 12, 1 to 11? I'm By the way, read. before I start, you see that arrow at the bottom of the paragraph that points mm -hmm. to the right? That's our little signal that there's more to come on the next slide. My voice is really off today, so I'm going to say no. You're passing. Okay. Pass. Who else is a reader this morning? Looks like you got it. <laughs> I'll, I'll read more if, uh, if there's oh. no other volunteers. Well, I appreciate it. You take a sip of water once in a while. There's a lot to do today. Okay, um, prayer by the church of P for Peter, Acts 12, verses 1 to 11. About that time, Herod the king laid violent hands on some who belonged to the church. He killed James, the brother of John, with a sword. And when he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded to arrest Peter also. This was during the days of unleavened bread. And when he had seized him, he put him in prison delivering him over to four squads of soldiers to guard him, intending after the Passover to bring him out to the people. So Peter was kept in prison, but earnest prayer for him was made to God by the church. Now when Herod was about to bring him out on that very night, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers, bound with two chains and sentries before the door were guarding the prison. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood next to him, and a light shone in the cell. He struck Peter on the side and woke him, saying, Get up quickly. And the chains fell off his hands. And the angel said to him, Dress yourself and put on your sandals. And he did so. And he said to him, Wrap your cloak around you and follow me. And he went out and followed him. He did not know that what was being done by the angel was real, but thought he was seeing a vision. When they had passed the first and the second guard, they came to the iron gate leading into the city. It opened for them of its own accord, and they went out and went along one street, and immediately the angel left him. When Peter came to himself, he said, now I am sure that the Lord has sent his angel and rescued me from the hand of Herod and from all that the Jewish people were expecting. All that the Jewish people were expecting. Now, this is the Jewish leaders who have uh, vengeance against the Lord and his plans. Now, you know that their plans were announced by Luke, the narrator, in verse 2. He killed James, that is Herod, killed James, the brother of John, with a sword. And when he saw that it pleased the Jewish leaders, I want, to, I want to say to you, most of the people were ignorant of these designs. When he saw that it pleased the Jewish leaders, he proceeded to arrest Peter also. So what's going to happen to Peter? Same thing. Same, same thing. thing. But you know, yeah. the, the Lord has great plans for Peter and his ministry, and for his the, witness. And Peter has to have a little uh, waking, awakening to humility. And of course, uh, in those times, uh, we have to remember that Jewish uh, uh, leaders did not do the actual um, um, what, killing Execution. or discipline. It was the Romans, correctly? They turned, that's right. He killed with its Herod, it his Herod has the sword. The yes. Jews do not have the sword. So they would have delivered Peter to, uh, to be killed by Herod. And Herod does their bidding because uh, his main thing is to keep peace. Correct. Carries out the laws. Yeah. Uh, he, he would also lose his job if, he, if there was a riot. <laughs> That's a long story. But he put him in prison and look how well guarded he is. Four squads of soldiers, right? Correct. You read in the next paragraph here, he is sleeping between two soldiers. He's bound with two chains. There are sentries on the door, but it only takes one angel. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I don't know what they said uh, to their... Uh, uh, the, the chief guard in the morning 
when Peter was gone, as in Acts 16, the jailer, but he leaves and he thinks he's seeing a vision. He gets out of the city safely and now he realizes it wasn't a vision. I really have been delivered from all that the Jewish people were expecting. And then he goes to the home of one of the disciples. I can't remember the name of that maid that comes to the door. Do you? You'll have to read Martha. on. In the, Martha. Pardon? Martha, wasn't it? We just learned that last week. Martha? I don't think so. If you learned it last week, it was in a different place. It's his, uh, an it's his uh, angel. Am I wrong on that? I think it's Martha. I I'm in another Bible study. Maybe that's where I got it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm distracted by a prayer request that's coming from Bobby about his mom, but I can't read it right now. Okay, so there is a deliverance that Peter had no expectation, but, well, whose prayers were answered? The people that were praying for him. Verse 5. Uh -huh. Earnest prayer to God by the church, which is the assembly church. of believers. We don't have a number. Well, this is, yeah, this is Acts, so it has to be the, the new church. Yes, and it's Acts 12, so we're way beyond that 5,000. Yeah. Uh, the church is, is multiplying. Okay, I found where he went. He went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, also called Mark. Uh -huh. And many people had gathered and were praying. Right. That's the prayer that's announced in verse 5. And the, and the girl was so overjoyed, she forgot to open the gate, but ran inside and announced Peter standing at the gate. So. What was her name? Her, Rhonda? Rhonda. Rhoda. Rhoda. No, Rhoda. 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 Okay. Rhoda. Okay. Not the TV character. No. So, so this is a, this is an amazing thing, and how glad they were to see him. And then he said, "I've got to get out of here uh, before I'm uh, discovered," and he left. All right. Let's go on to uh, uh, a, a section from an epic psalm, uh, a psalm that retraces the history of many deliverances in response to prayer. And this particular one from Psalm 107, 28 to 30 is about, that should be 23 to 30, 23 to 30. This is a Psalm uh, that becomes a, a type, almost a prophecy of the time when the disciples were out in the boat with Jesus. And you'll recognize it. Okay, so who's up for reading uh, the Mariner's Prayer, I called it. Uh, I guess I'll have to. Uh, a Mariner's Prayer, Psalm 107, 28 to 30. Some went down to the sea and ship, doing business on the great waters. They saw the deeds of the Lord, his wondrous works in the deep. For he commanded and raised the stormy wind, which lifted up the waves of the sea. They mounted up to heaven. They went down to the depths. Their courage melted away in their evil plights. They reeled and staggered like drunken men and were at their wits end. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble and he delivered them from their, their distress. He made the storm be still and the waves of the sea were hushed. Then they were glad that the waters were quiet, and he brought them to their desired haven. Let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love, for his wondrous works to the, ch to the children of man. Mariner's Prayer, Psalm 107, 28 to 30. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. What pops out at you in this uh, section of this large psalm? 
what strikes you as unusual or dramatic? They saw the deeds of the Lord, his wondrous works. No. And what were his wondrous works at that moment in their lives? Verse 25. That the waves went up to the heavens and down to the sea. I mean, he did that. None, none of you served in the Navy and, and went out on, uh, on the large uh, destroyers and, uh, during the Second World War. I'm thinking no. you're not that old. But, but those who served in the Navy, when they had to go despite the weather was contrary. <laughs> when, when you're on a ship and you see the towering water above you, maybe 20, 35 feet. And the next moment you're up on top and you're looking down deep into the waves. I want to point out in the, at the end of verse 26, their courage melted away in their evil plight. The word evil is not their evil, but the evil that would befall them of course, we have to realize that those mariners that are celebrated here are believers. But they realize in verse 27, what does it mean to be at your wit's end? They give it up. You can't even think straight. Yeah, you don't know who else or what else to do. There's no, no other uh, resources. You're going to die. You're going to die, yeah. So they cried to the Lord in their trouble. And he delivered them. He made the storm be still and the waves were hushed. Just like when Jesus did it for the disciples in the boat when they were afraid and they woke him up. Lord, don't you care that we perish? <laughs> oh, men of little faith. Um, Pastor, were you in the Navy? Just asking. No, I was in the Air Force, and I, I the only uh, did we go on a ship at all? The Air Force. Yeah, our furniture did, our car did, but we didn't. We were <laughs> never. Well, that wasn't an Air Force ship. We we booked package uh, passage on on a supply ship going to an island off the coast of Greece for a weekend. Wow. Um, so, Pastor, I'm going to digress a second more. And uh, so in 1983, my husband and I, he, he had purchased his second houseboat. And it was, uh, we had hired a captain to take us from New Jersey to Washington, D.C. Well, fast forward, in the middle of the Delaware Bay, we ran into the back end of a storm in a houseboat on that water. And that was an example of, of going into the trough and seeing the water way above the houseboat through those big windows that they're in houseboats and then coming up on top. It was something I guess I'll never forget. Hopefully my brain stays there. And it was, it was that same thing. The whole thing shook and, um, the, we were able to get out to a cove. We almost smashed on the side of the thing, but we didn't. And, and uh, more things happened after that. But that is exactly what I've seen now. I, mean, I guess all kind of fishermen people would know that, that the waves go way up and you go down. And if you're lucky, you come back up and you go back and down. It was unbelievable. Yeah. They also, the uh, waves will also take you side to side and rock you good. Um, if you're but, in the wrong way, you have to point some way, I don't know, into them or something, I don't know. Well, when John came home from Vietnam in 1969, yeah. um, he received orders and he came home in April, early April, and had his 30-day leave. And so around the 1st of May is when he was assigned to Germany. And we happened to have um, surface travel, and we were very fortunate that year to travel on the SS United States. The last year she crossed the Atlantic all year long in 1969. And it was early May in the North Atlantic. And the Atlantic was not bad, but the last day going from um, 
oh, I can't remember where we docked in uh, England, we had to go to Bremerhaven. The English Channel was horrible. Um, and we rocked from side to side. We could sit in the lounge in the cabin classes where most of the military were, and we could look out to the horizon and just watch it go up and down from side to side. In fact, it was so bad that day, they, we had to strap our chairs in the dining room onto our tables and they only filled glasses half full. They had skid proof uh, mats on the tables and everything, but uh, there were a lot of sick people on that day, yeah. last day of that trip, so. And that was scary. Yeah. Great for me. Yeah. Uh, back to Chris, uh, were you afraid you were going to be swamped and your, your house oh, yeah. would be destroyed? In fact, one of the, we, had, we had two other passengers beside the captain, and she was our neighbor back at the marina. And she kept saying, scuttle it, go to the side and scuttle it. But, you know, the captain kept trying. Yes, we, we had no doubt that that would happen. This was a flimsy houseboat in the middle of a storm or not in the middle, we were on the back end of that storm. And the, I have to say the waves were probably 10, 12 feet. I don't know, you know, w when you're in the trough, they look like they're 30 feet, but it wasn't that high, but it was, it, it was something we got out of. The Lord brought us out of it, but um, I don't know that we prayed that well then, but he must've been there with us. The angels were with us. <laughs> the, the Lord answers many prayers that never get spoken because number one he knows our fears and number two the holy spirit prays for us with sighs too deep for words well that happened for sure yes all right this is a great psalm to read uh, read the whole thing sometime it rehearses many deliverances that the lord gave to his people we'll go on and now this is a very short summary from Psalm 99, verse 6. Moses and Aaron were among his priests, and Samuel was among those who called on his name. To call on the Lord's name is, is to pray and to believe what he has promised. They called upon the Lord, and he answered them. No details, but a summary in Psalm 99 of this idea that we're getting today. Just one Simple idea, answered prayers. You remember the leper. Uh, Judy, uh, back to you, I think. Okay. Uh, a leper's prayer to Jesus in Matthew 8, verses 2 to 3. And a leopard came to him and bowed down before him and said, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him, saying, I am willing, be cleansed. And immediately his leprosy was cleansed. Okay, good, thank you. Now, what do you learn from this brief two verse account of a healing? What's the first thing you notice? That the leper knew that Jesus was the Lord. All right, he addresses him using that special name. What's the next thing you learn about prayer? It can't be answered right away. Uh, no, well, he, he puts in there, if you are willing, yeah. which is, um, I, I guess on our part, we're supposed to pray knowing the Lord can, but again, I know the Lord has his will, so they're asking for the Lord's will. Or, well, the pro I can't, well, it's not sound. Doesn't sound. Right. Prayer is your will done. A lot of times we ask for something that isn't what the Lord wills. So, Correct. That's the way. So yeah. He is saying, if you're willing, that's what I would like. Okay. Yeah. Right. And he has faith, doesn't he? How do yeah. you know that? Because he knows that God can or Jesus can do it. Yeah. He can make me clean. So immediately there's an answer to prayer. Jesus stretches out his hand, announces that he is this is according to his will. And then the two words be cleansed in the Greek is only one word. And immediately he is cleansed. 
Now, you know that in those days, and it would be true in our day too, that the leper's disease is so contagious, he can't be around anybody else. You talk about quarantine. Mm -hmm. So that to be healed of this is a great gift. Now, here's an unusual uh, incident of prayer in the Old Testament. Daniel in chapter 10. Chris, just two verses, please. Okay. Daniel, having fasted for three weeks, was greatly weakened. And then he saw a vision and heard a voice. Don't be afraid, Daniel, for, for from the first day that you set your heart on understanding this and on humbling yourself before your God, your words were heard, and I have come in response to your words. Again, one having the appearance of a man touched me and strengthened me, and he said, O oh man, greatly loved, fear not. Peace be with you. Be strong and of good courage. And he spoke to me. I was strengthened and said, Let my Lord speak for you, having strengthened me. And that is Daniel's 10, number 12, I guess. Oh, and 18. Now, that part that I put in italics is my summary of some previous verses. Daniel was refusing to eat the delicacies that the king's servants were setting before him. And he had very little to eat. He wasn't, it wasn't a total fast. But because of his extremely limited diet, uh, if you've been a nurse, you know that sometimes in the hospital, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Judy, that you have to restrict the diet to liquids only or the IV drip. Mm -hmm. yep, sometimes they do. And people become very, yeah, Linda's a, a nurse too, or was, and people become uh, weakened in this, in this state, correct? Correct. If, if there's no protein, it's only... Uh, uh, no protein. Yeah, no proteins to build up the body. Okay. And their body is also laying down and the muscles are... Weakening. Weakening. Okay. Uh, that wasn't Daniel's case, but he was needing strength. Now, you have to read uh, around a lot to try to figure out what's going on here. In verse 18, one having the appearance of a man. Some people believe, and I kind of go along with it, that this is the pre-incarnate Christ. Other people have said that this is a, a type of a prophet, but I don't know how he comes and appears. There's no introduction. But he, he gives the message that his prayer, that da Daniel's prayer have been, has, have been answered. It was more than one prayer. so that there is an answer in response. Not a very complicated situation, but what is hard for us to understand is who are these people who are doing the speaking? The angel of the Lord also is involved, or the angel... Uh, that God sends to be the messenger. You know, one of the duties of angels is a messenger. Their name means messenger. Okay, any questions or responses to this unusual situation? I assumed it was an angel, so I was wrong. Well, uh, <laughs> You go ahead and read the whole 10th chapter and then uh, let us know what you find out. Okay. I've read it and reread it. I've looked at the notes. <laughs> Here's my answer. When the experts disagree, I don't make a final decision either. <laughs> that works for me. Yeah. But, uh, you know, uh, someone else might come along and be very dogmatic about it and say, well, I know what it was. Oh, all right. I'll listen to you. You may have a point. 
Some things in the Bible are not as clear as others. All right. And I accept that. I accept my limitations, which are many. How about you? Yep. All right. That's why it's always, in my opinion, is safer to say than blank, you know, like this is it. In my opinion, <laughs> so you, it, it's subject okay. to uh, correction versus. Uh, Good answer, I think. Now, Elijah is a very active uh, prayer, and uh, this is one of the times that he has called upon the Lord to bring healing, only it isn't he that brings healing. Uh, we're back to Chris, I believe. Sure, no problem. Elijah, oh, well, okay, 1 Kings 17, 17 to 24. After this, the son of the woman, the mistress of the house, became ill. And his illness was so severe that there, were no, there was no breath left in him. And she said to Elijah, What have you against me, O man of God? You have come to me to bring my sin to remembrance and to cause the death of my son. And he said to her, Give me your name. And he looked him from her arms. And he took him from her arms and carried him up to the upper chamber where he lodged and laid him on his own bed. And he cried to the Lord, O Lord, my God, have you brought calamity even upon the widow with whom I sojourn by killing her son? Then he stretched himself upon the child three times and cried to the Lord, O Lord, my God, let this child's life come into him again. And the Lord listened to the voice of Elijah and the life of the child came into him again, and he revived. And Elijah took the child and brought him down from the upper chamber into the house and delivered him to his mother. And Elijah said, See, your son lives. And the woman said to Elijah, Now I know that you are a man of God, and that the word of the Lord is in your mouth. 1 Kings 17, 17 to 24. Thank you, Chris. Uh, what are we to learn from this wonderful prayer of Elijah? Um, it's a short prayer. He said, God, why the that calamity was brought on to the woman that was helping him. It's like... Yeah, she accuses him of being <laughs> somewhat of the cause. You've mm -hmm. come to bring my sin to remembrance. Does she think that her son is going to die because of her sin? Well, she did, and it sounds like he was dead. Yeah. She wasn't breathing. He wasn't very much alive. So. All right. Well, that can happen too, because my husband died for a few minutes and they revived him again. The yes, it can. He went flatline. Now, we don't have the medical equipment there to measure the, no. we can't determine, but I believe that he was definitely dead and this was not just a form of CPR. With the paddles. <laughs> when you go to the, fa the place where Paul is preaching and this man falls uh, because he's so sleepy, either because the sermon was way too long <laughs> <laughs> or because the smoke from the oil lamps uh, had overcome him. But uh, Paul was preaching a long time, you know, and he fell, and Paul went down and, and picked him up and, and put life back in him again. And the Lord answered Paul's prayer there. Yeah. Uh, this, this son was dead. And the evidence that the woman receives in verse 24 is what? No breath. You're a man of God. God. Many times the Lord 
allows, permits, or causes a miracle to occur through one of his people as evidence that he is present in their lives with power and authority. The presence of a miracle is the announcement that God is present. And every time you see or read about a miracle in, uh, in the Bible, I want you to think about what God is causing to happen there. You understand what I'm saying to you? There are miracles happening every day, some through medical means, but they're still miracles that people are alive and kept alive. Those, the two of you that have been nurses, you could recite to me dozens of cases, I'm sure, where the patient was not expected to do very well. I didn't say die, Mrs. Decker. And you applied medicine, but still there was great doubt. And you stepped back and realized, am I putting words in your mouth, Judy, Chris? Mm -hmm. uh, Linda? No, no, no. no. And you knew it was the Lord's work, but you couldn't prove it. Have you been in rooms where the people are praying over the sick one? Not sure, but yes. How does that affect your ministry as a nurse? Sorry, you on. Um, well, it certainly reinforce, reinforces our own our own faith, that's for sure. And uh, uh, I think you always know that God is in control of whatever you are doing and carrying out and that the medicine he allows you to, uh, to give and the treatments he allows you to do are through, are through his hands really and through his uh, allowing us to do his will. We were last night we were looking for an answer. Uh, Last night you were looking for an answer to prayer for your wife Pat. Yeah. And we and we still are praying for her. Yeah. I want you to let her know that when you talk to her. Please. Appreciate you. Yeah. Yes. And Elijah said. See, your son lives. And the woman said to Elijah, Now I know that you are a man of God, and that the word of the Lord in your mouth is truth. See, the miracle authenticates the message and the messenger. Mm -hmm. And that happens many times in the scriptures. It happens in the book of Acts. The great authority of the apostles as they go out and take the message of Jesus the Savior. Well, who are you that we should believe what you say? And there is an authentication through the miracles that Peter and Paul and others do. No, the Lord does them. They are the instrument through whom God works. I don't think a man or a woman ever does a miracle. It's the hand of the Lord through them. Mm -hmm. yep. And sometimes I think that a patient gets better in spite of the medicine. <laughs> I'm not That's saying. I was the dietitian. <laughs> you understand. All right. The time goes by so quickly and uh, we never, we never finish everything. Um, Let's do at least one more example, shall we? Okay. Okay. Uh, this is a good one. Okay, I'll, I'll take this one. Uh, the church before Pentecost, Acts 1, 13 to 15, and verses 21 to 26. And when they had entered, they went up to the upper room where they were staying, Peter and John and James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James, the son of Elpheus, and Simon, the Zealot, and Judas, the son of James. All these, with one accord, were devoting themselves to prayer together. 
with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus and his brothers. Now, before you go on, I want you to answer this question. In that list of the apostles that Jesus appointed, that he chose, who's missing? Um, uh, the bad one. <laughs> Oh, Judas. Judas Iscariot was the... Was and the other Judas, too. Yeah, see, there are two Judases. Yeah, there so are two Judases. This so one is distinguished. By the son of James, yeah. So the one that's not mentioned is... Is Judas Iscari Iscariot, right? That's where yeah. he was from. So oh, he's, he's from. missing. Why is he missing? Well, has he already killed himself? Yes, he has. It's a result of... Uh, knowing what he did to, uh, and that Jesus was Lord. He had remorse, but no faith. Correct. <clears throat> so he's missing. So I'm giving you that hint of why they are praying. And then Judy, you can go on. At that time, Peter stood up and spoke about the necessity of replacing Judas. Ah. So one of the men who had accompanied us during all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John until the day when he was taken up from us, one of these men must become, become with us a witness to his resurrection. And they put forward to Joseph, two, two, Joseph, and they put forth two, Joseph called Barsabbas, who was also called Justice, and Math uh, Matthias. And they prayed and said, You, Lord, who know the hearts of all, show which one of these two you have chosen to take the place in this ministry and apostleship from which Judas turned aside to go to his own place. And they cast lots for them, and the lot fell on Matthias, Matthias, and he was numbered with the 11 apostles. Wow. Oh, so now they're 12. Okay. I never realized they cast lots for him. Yep, I remember that. What happened to Justice? Uh, we never learn of his name. I don't even have any answer from tradition to give you. Tradition is not scripture, so I probably wouldn't tell you anyway. But here we've got two. But what are the requirements? Um, they have to be, the person has to be someone who has accompanied them. Okay. And it has to be from the baptism of John until the day when Jesus ascended into heaven. That's the taken up idea. Yep. And well, those... Yeah. And they found two who fit that description. So you're concerned about casting lots, throwing dice. Yeah, I, I guess I never realized they kept, because we only hear hear it used in the negative uh, when they were casting lots for Christ uh, garment, I believe. Um, so I guess it must. I don't know, was it like a, a dice game? Well, I wouldn't use the word game. Lord, dice, or, 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 show us by these means uh, which one you have chosen. They believed that the Lord would cause the lot to fall upon his choice. Nice. Hmm. Now, it isn't as unusual as you think, because the priest in the Old Testament, in the Old Testament had the, this uh, breastplate and on it were this mysterious thing called the Urim and the Thummim. And that was used to, to judge in some cases. The details are very foggy in my memory, so I won't even try to bring it up. But at times, when you don't know what to do, and you say to the Lord, show me, well, stand back and, and see how things appear to fall into place. But they don't just fall into place. It is the Lord which, who is issuing a pointer. Sometimes it's through circumstances, as when one of the alternatives suddenly becomes unavailable. Suppose you were buying a house and you had two to choose from, 
and you didn't know which one to buy. Now, Judy, you went through this recently when you were looking at what uh, independent living to go into and you did some research, right? Yeah. Well, here's my method. I do research when I don't know, and I believe that through that, the Lord gives us wisdom to make choices. Is that how you felt about your choice? Uh, well, yeah, you do a pros and a cons type of list for the most part. Uh -huh. uh, to, you know, to, I guess list as many things that you can think of that's good about it and maybe the negatives about it and try to see, you know, what outnumbers what for the most part. Of course, you can arrange that to come out to your advantage too if you are not using wisdom when you do it. Well, that's, that's the case when you are not casting lots. Correct. Well, uh, you could. If you had two that appeared to be equal, I suppose you could do that. But, and I'm sure there are people who have. You know, but it's amazing. I think here's where, like you said, prayer comes into, into play in that the Lord knows and, and helps you uh, make that decision. Um, when you look at that list, um, you know, there's just, there's just amazingly many things he has that, as I say, fall in place. So I guess it's, it's, uh, I, <laughs> if I were to cast lots, he made it all fall in place. I pray for wisdom and discernment. Correct. And when I can't decide, sometimes the answer is, well, don't decide or don't decide yet. Or wait, yeah, wait. When you're talking about big decisions like who to marry or what house to buy or a car to buy, you know, when there's thousands of dollars or a lifetime, uh, these are serious things. I can't imagine a, a, a young man, a young woman getting married today who are believers who would enter it without much prayer. And uh, we need to get on to uh, other things in our day. Um, so I'm going to pray with you now and uh, we'll continue this uh, if God is willing uh, next time. We're looking at examples of times in the Bible that God answered prayer when it is very clear that his will must be done. His will is done uncountable numbers of times in our lives. And sometimes you're aware of it. I want you to learn to pray expecting God to guide you in the answers to your prayers, especially when there's a decision to make. He knows your heart. He knows the difficulty that you and I have when we can't decide. Lord God, take us from where we are to where you want us to be in faith in you and with love toward one another. That in all our decisions, we might consult you and seek your wisdom, and believe that you will indeed give us an answer to our prayers. We ask it in the name of Jesus Christ, your Son. Amen. Amen. Amen.